Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of First Christian Church. Welcome to those who are worshiping here in person and to those who are worshiping with us virtually on, on video. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord, whether we are together in this space or together uh, anywhere else. Uh, we are glad that you're worshiping with us, and we pray that this time will be a blessing in your life. I invite you to worship now as we listen to the morning prayer. Mm -hmm. We worship Creator God, the Holy One. Made in God's image, we are precious in God's sight. We join Jesus Christ, Son of God, as we stand at the river, ready to share in His baptism. We welcome the Holy Spirit, Dove of Peace, who sets us on fire with the power of God's love. Thank you for all standing as you were able. <laughs>
Holy God, we have all this my name, and we pray for the courage and strength to answer your call. As we hear the story of Jesus' baptism, may we too experience the renewing power of a rebirth in the Holy Spirit. Inspire us in this time of worship that we may claim our own identity as your beloved children. Amen. When word reached the apostles in Jerusalem that Samaria had accepted God's word, they commissioned Peter and John to go to Samaria. Peter and John went down to Samaria, where they prayed that the new believers would receive the Holy Spirit. This was because the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. We prepare for a time of prayer. We have the opportunity to share joys and concerns with one another and lift them to God in prayer. And so I invite you to share whatever is on your heart this morning. will lose one hand and they might see if they can rebuild the other. So his he and his family need a good prayer. Thank you. We pray for that young person and his his family and mm -hmm. for the medical people taking care of them. Any other joys or concerns? Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy God, even as we step into this new year, this 2022, we find it hard to fear not. We've been challenged by pandemic, isolation, uncertainties, and worries. But we're eager to draw close to you. We're eager to experience your spirit descending into our lives. So claim us in this hour, we pray. As we hear again the story of your son's baptism, may we experience the renewing power of the Holy Spirit and claim our own identity as your beloved children. We lift up names and situations which concern us, people who face illness and grief, whose lives are torn by poverty, war, addiction, and hopelessness. We ask for your loving mercy on them, O oh Lord. Heal them and bind up their wounds. Merciful God, our world is filled with strife, threats of violence, hunger, disease, alienation. Heal us and this world, O oh Lord. Renew us with your life-giving waters and reaffirm our baptisms as your children and make us people of peace and mercy. God of baptism and the communion table, we pray that you would lead us into the world in ministry, the ministry to which you have called us. We pray through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now come to a time of installation and dedication of our new officers, elders, and deacons that have been chosen by this congregation to lead us in ministry in this coming year. From 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. On the back of the insert in your bulletin are a list of those persons who are being installed today who have been chosen to lead us in various ways. Some among us are elders. They are gifted with a grasp of the gospel exemplified in word and deed. They give expression of the faith in teaching and in praying at the Lord's table. They have a vision of the church and its mission and are dedicated to expressing it in wise counsel. Some among us are members of the diaconate. They are gifted with the ability to assist in the ministration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They fulfill administrative responsibilities in the conduct of the church's work. Some of us are board officers and mission team leaders. They serve in leadership capacities as the church seeks to fulfill its ministry under the headship of Christ. They seek to build up the church in every way. So I invite those whose names are listed on the back of the insert to please stand and remain standing in your place. Thank you. 
to you, members and friends of the congregation, do you pledge your eager support to the work of God in this congregation under the leadership of these whom you share in share ministry in this body of Christ, and pray God's blessing upon them as together we seek to support one another in selfless service. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we rejoice that you have called us to be your people in this time and place. Help us to fulfill the mission to which you call us. Guide and direct us as we seek to do your will. Bless these leaders of First Christian Church and fill them with hope and encouragement. And may your spirit be on this congregation as we work together for the sake of your kingdom and to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the authority of this congregation, I now declare you properly in, installed and dedicated. May grace and peace be yours as you serve God and God's people. You may be seated, except for Chris Callahan. I invite Chris to come join us up here on the... And you can stand on the other side of Mary Alice there. Chris is our outgoing moderator, leader of the board and the congregation of First Christian Church, and he has done it for more than he initially signed up for it <laughs> and has done much. So we have this proclamation to share. On behalf of the members and friends of First Christian Church, Black Mountain, North Carolina, a word of appreciation for the leadership of James C. Callahan. Whereas James C. Chris Callahan has served First Christian yeah, Church. Right this. <laughs> there, there's a reason it was done this way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whereas James C. Chris Callahan has served First, First Christian Church in a variety of ways over the years. And whereas Chris was elected to be moderator of the congregation and First Christian Church's Board of Directors in December 2019 for a one-year term. And? Whereas on March 15th, 2020, FCC's board, led by moderator Chris, made the hard decision to cease in-person gatherings. And whereas, Chris learned how to set up and lead virtual meetings on Zoom, and whereas Chris made those meetings lighthearted by including virtual backgrounds and silly masks, and whereas throughout the pandemic, Chris has con continued to conduct meetings on Zoom and guide the ministry and business of the congregation, and Whereas, in the continuing uncertainty of pandemic restrictions, Chris proposed a continuation of FCC's budget and terms of office for the congregation's leadership, which meant he served an additional year as moderator. And whereas, Chris has done all this and more with integrity, commitment, faith, and most of all, humor. <laughs> Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members and friends of First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Black Mountain, North Carolina, do hereby express our love, appreciation, and gratitude to Chris Callahan. <laughs> and we have the proclamation duly signed by the pastor and the new moderator of the congregation. It's uh, suitable for framing or for starting fires in the fireplace. <laughs> Thank you very much.
gifts we bring during worship are meant to be an expression of our gratitude and trust for all God has done for us and for all God is going to do. We who have heard the call to follow Jesus in baptism are also offering ourselves to the world and opening ourselves to God's blessing every time we give of ourselves. May we remember all that God has done and is doing while we joyfully offer our gifts. Let us join in singing together our praise to God. I invite you to stand as we are able. Gracious God, as we bring our offering, help us find ways to live the good news of your love for one and all. Help us use these gifts and our time and talents in service with Jesus, your beloved Son. Amen. Our Gospel reading the story of Jesus' baptism comes from Luke's Gospel, the third chapter, beginning with verse 15. <clears throat> the people were filled with expectation, and everyone wondered whether John might be the Messiah. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them proclaiming good news to the people. When everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven, you are my son whom I dearly love, in you I find happiness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This Sunday is called the Baptism of the Lord. The story of Jesus' baptism is found in all four Gospels, which says something about its importance to the early church. From the beginning, people have been initiated into a new life as followers of Christ by following Jesus' example and being baptized. Jesus' final instructions to his disciples in Matthew's Gospel were for them to go into the world making disciples, teaching all that Jesus had taught, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That phrase, which we call the Trinitarian formula, is how we have baptized people into the church and new life in Christ ever since. <clears throat> I remember my own baptism 52 years ago 
when I waded into the waters of the Huilu River and was baptized Nazina Yatata Tiamwana Tiamhebe Santo. We're going to spend a few minutes thinking about what that phrase means. But don't worry, we're going to think, talk about it in English, not in Kichuka. <laughs> The early church struggled with how to describe the full experience of God. How, for instance, could they understand the man Jesus being known to them as the Christ, the Son of God? And how did this relate to their experience of God's Spirit coming on them after Jesus' resurrection on that first Pentecost? Well, it took some time, and it took some church discussions, we could also say some church fights, to come up with a way of articulating an understanding of God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what is it, really, this Holy Spirit? And what does it do? God the Father, I think, is understandable, even as we make sure we don't limit God to gender roles. We can say God the mother or God the parent just as well. People have all experienced fathers and mothers or some kind of parental figure. And even if our own experience with fathers is less than perfect, even if it brings back painful memories, we know what a father or mother should be. We have an ideal image of a father or mother and their parental love. And so it's understood that when we call God Father, we have this parental image in mind. God the Father or Mother is an ancient metaphor that still works. God the Son is perhaps even more concrete. Jesus is God in the flesh, God literally down to earth. During his lifetime, people interacted with Jesus and had the chance to look God right in the eye, to hear his voice and to get his attention. Jesus wasn't a concept or an underlying force or a loving feeling. Jesus was a person. He was a guy. He had a face. He had a, perhaps a certain way of walking that his friends could recognize from a distance. You could go right up to Jesus and shake his hand, or maybe give him an elbow bump in these times of pandemic. God the parent we get, we understand. God the son we get. But God the Holy Spirit First of all, the name is kind of confusing. Spirit is the word we use for a person's soul, their inner life, or perhaps the energy they have for something. A spirit can be a ghost. Older translations of the Bible call the Holy Spirit just that, the Holy Ghost. Is the Holy Spirit a phenomenon, a phantom? Is it God's soul? The Greek word pneuma, which is translated as spirit, can also mean breath or wind. That makes the whole thing even less clear. Why don't we say Father, Son, and Holy Breath? What really is the Holy Spirit? As I said, we know what God the Father, Mother does. God the Father creates. God the Mother makes things. God makes everything from mountains to molecules. God also makes maple trees and monarch butterflies. We know what God the Creator does. We know what the Son did. Jesus taught and healed. He hung out with questionable friends. He suffered, died, and was buried. He rose from the dead, taught a bit more, ascended into heaven, and promised to come again. <clears throat> All 
All of these things about Jesus have been preserved and handed down through the centuries in writings and artwork and song. We know very well what God the Son has done. What about God the Holy Spirit? What is it and what does it do? We shouldn't feel bad or inadequate if we don't have a good answer. Some of the very earliest Christians didn't seem to have known much about it either. In our reading from Acts that Jamie read a few minutes ago, we, hear, we heard Peter and John went down to Samaria where they prayed that the new believers would receive the Holy Spirit. This was because the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Several chapters later, Paul traveled to Ephesus and questioned people who had been baptized there, who admitted that they hadn't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So what is it? Let's start with what it isn't. The Holy Spirit isn't magic. It isn't a superpower. The Holy Spirit isn't something you can take to get supernatural abilities or the power to predict the future. What the Holy Spirit is, is God. The Spirit is one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Christian baptism is done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If God, the parent, is the one who speaks reality into being, and God, the Son, is the creative word of God, God with skin on, then the Holy Spirit is God's voice. The Holy Spirit is the present tense of God. It is God active in the hearts, minds, and imaginations of the body of Christ, the church. What does the Holy Spirit do? <clears throat> in the words of Martin Luther, the Spirit calls, gathers, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth. The Holy Spirit is the source of faith. <clears throat> it gives us the faith we need as individuals to believe in the reality of God and the unlikely truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And it gives the faith that binds God's people together into the church, the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit calls us into the church and the Holy Spirit sends us out into the world. We say we are taught that we are made right before God by faith in Jesus Christ, that it is God's work alone, not ours, that saves us. That's pretty much the very core of what it means to be Christian. God doesn't love us because we deserve to be loved but because of God's actions through Jesus' death and resurrection. God doesn't owe us anything, but rather God gives us everything out of mercy and grace. The shorthand we use for this is justification by faith. Think about when you open a Word document on the computer. You have a choice of how you're going to justify the text on your, on your page. When you justify something when writing, you justify the margins of the text. So you line the words up. You can justify to the left of the page, or the right, or both. The beginning of each line of words starts or stops the same distance from the edge of the paper as the line above or below, forming a straight line. We are justified to God 
when we are lined up with God's will. We are made perfect in God's eyes. This is clearly something that we cannot pull off by our own effort. We can't do it. So God does it. We aren't justified by anything we do, only by faith in what Jesus has done. But isn't faith, having faith, still something we have to do, someone might ask? Isn't it still up to us in that way? It would be <clears throat> if faith was something that came from our own heads or from our hearts or wills or imaginations. Having faith would count as us doing something if faith was something we did, if faith was something we made. But we don't produce or make faith. God makes faith. It's a gift given to us by the Holy Spirit. So yes, even our own faith is a gift from God. We are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, Mother, creates us and all that there is. God the Son became one of us, lived with us, died to forgive us. God the Spirit makes us able to believe all of that. The Holy Spirit makes us able to care. The Holy Spirit inspires us to live out our baptism every day in all that we do. In baptism, God the Mother makes us new. In baptism, the ancient story of the death and resurrection of God the Son becomes our personal story. In baptism, God the Holy Spirit brings us faith and calls us to follow. You are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven and loved in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are sent into the world to make a difference in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what God does and how God does it through you and through me. Thanks be to God. Amen. we come to this table set with this holy meal, we're reminded of the Holy Spirit at work in our midst. Though we can't see or touch the Spirit, we see the action of God's Spirit in our congregation's life. Here we find common language, share and share a common meal. Here our differences take a back seat. For Jesus invites each of us to take a place at this table. All are welcome, for we are all God's beloved. Let us join in singing our communion hymn, Here is Bread, Here is Wine.
Jesus was at supper with his friends, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This bread represents my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That same meal, Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he poured it and gave it to them, saying, This cup represents the new covenant, sealed in my blood and poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Gracious God, the table of bread and cup is before us once again, and we thank you for that. Help us to appreciate even more what this meal represents, the body and blood of your only begotten Son, whom you sent to live on earth, to live a sinless life, and die a horrible death for sinners, for us. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup, direct our hearts and minds to gratefully appreciate all you have provided for us, your Son and eternal life through him. We come now in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's life, death, and resurrection, and proclaim his ongoing presence with us. I invite you to stand as you are able to sing our hymn of invitation, Gracious Spirit, dwell with me.
we prepare to leave this time of worship, know that you are beloved children of God. Go now with God's blessing and demonstrate God's love in all that you say and do. Amen.